In previous episodes covering the period between 41 and 38 BC, we saw how Octavian defeated Mark Antony's brother Lucius and his wife Fulvia in Italy, while Antony's lieutenant Ventidius successfully repulsed a Pompeian Parthian invasion in the east. At the same time, the uneasy alliance agreed at Misenum between Octavian, Antony and Sextus Pompey had disintegrated, despite the three men all being linked by marriage. The peace of Misenum was broken less than a year after it was made, and the Sicilian War reignited. In this episode, we shall cover Octavian's planned invasion of the island, and the numerous disasters that plagued the expedition. When the Romans conquered a new territory, there was always one surprising thing they left behind – massive colosseums. You see, gladiatorial combat was big business. The gladiators themselves were huge celebrities, rivaling the modern world's star athletes. But for these gladiators' financial backers, the rewards of success were incredibly lucrative, even when the Roman economy was suffering. Today, there are similar, overlooked opportunities that allow savvy investors to see profit, even when other investments are tanking. But it's way easier to get in. Take today's sponsor, Masterworks, for example. Located in New York City's financial district, Masterworks has unlocked the potential of a $1.7 trillion alternative investment class, contemporary art. Enabling everyday investors to enter the previously billionaire-driven art market without spending millions. Why art? Because unlike traditional investments like stocks and bonds, art's value may be less affected by current events. While many markets were crushed in 2022, Masterworks saw 9 returns of 9%, 10%, 13%, 17%, 21%, 27%, 33%, 35%, and 36%, netting tens of millions for their investors. In fact, their performance has been so strong, CNBC, Forbes, CNN, and others are raving about the company. With numbers like that, you can see why over 617,000 people have become members. In fact, demand is so high that offerings have sold out within hours, meaning you might miss your chance quickly, that our subscribers can open a free, no-obligation account right now at the link in the description. Octavian likely had been actively looking for reasons to undermine the peace treaty and declare war on Sextus. Antony's extortion of Sextus's provinces and the defection of Menas to Octavian had certainly been significant factors. But more importantly, Octavian's forces had also captured pirates around the Mediterranean, who Octavian proclaimed were in service to Sextus, despite Sextus denying this. To add personal insult to this, Octavian divorced Scribonia, the daughter of Sextus's brother-in-law. Even more egregiously, Octavian had declared this divorce in October 39 BC, immediately after Scribonia gave birth to his only natural child, Julia. In all likelihood, Octavian had used the Pact of Misenum merely to buy time to consolidate his position until he was ready. By the spring of 38 BC, his forces were amassed, though the precise numbers for this time are unclear. Almost non-stop war had drained Italy of its manpower, but soldiers had been raised from provinces in Illyria, Gaul and Hispania. Octavian would have had approximately 25 legions under his command, though how many he had immediate access to is unknown. His fleet size is also hard to know, though it must have been large enough for Octavian to feel confident to challenge Sextus, so perhaps 150 to 200 warships would be a reasonable estimate. Octavian split this force into two parts, planning to attack Sicily from two fronts. The first, sailing from Etruria, would be commanded by the defector Menes and Calvisius Sabinus, an officer who had served competently under Caesar's command during the Pharsalus campaign. The second, leaving from Tarentum, would be commanded by Octavian himself. The army, meanwhile, would march down to Regium in preparation to be transported across to Sicily once the Pompeian fleet had been annihilated. Upon hearing of these movements, Sextus similarly divided his navy into two, commanding one portion in Messana, awaiting Octavian's arrival, while sending a second portion under his freedman Menecrates to confront Menes and Calvisius. Menecrates' fleet came upon the Etrurian fleet at night near Cumae. However, neither side wished to risk a dangerous night battle, so Menes and Calvius retreated into the bay. 
When morning broke, they drew their fleet up in a defensive crescent formation, with Menes commanding the left and Calvisius the right, positioning themselves as close to the shore as possible, so that Menocrates' ships would not be able to break through their line. Menocrates exploited this, attacking across the line and pushing Octavian's fleet back, where many of their ships were either beached or caught on rocks and rendered immobile. Menocrates, with the advantage of the open sea at his back, was able to continually cycle fresh ships into the fight, while much of the Caesarian fleet was effectively stranded. In Appian's words, it was as if Menes and Calvius's men were like land forces contending against sea forces. As the battle raged, Menocrates caught sight of Menes's ship and ordered his vessel to attack. The two ships rammed into each other and grapples were thrown, binding the two ships together, with fierce fighting breaking out on the decks. Menes's ship was slightly taller than Menocrates's, so his men had a slight advantage as arrows, stones and javelins flew between the two crews. During the fighting, both commanders were wounded. Menas was shot through the arm with an arrow and Menocrates took a javelin to the thigh. The latter was rendered unable to fight, but continued to urge his men on. Despite their brave fighting, however, Menas's men gradually got the upper hand, and rather than be taken captive, Menocrates flung himself into the sea and drowned. Calvisius, keen to capitalize on this success, moved his ship and a few others to Menas's flank, managing to cut off part of the Pompeian ships there and forcing them to retreat with Calvisius in pursuit. Nonetheless, the move had weakened the Caesarian right, and many were destroyed or burnt on the rocks, the remnants only being saved by the return of Calvisius's ships. The battle ended as night fell. The Caesarians had had the worst of the fighting, losing far more vessels than the Pompeians. Nevertheless, with the death of Menocrates, the Pompeians had lost one of their most talented naval commanders, and the fleet, now under the command of Menocrates' lieutenant Democaris, retreated to Sicily. The Caesarians cautiously maintained their position, but once they had become certain that the Pompeian fleet had left, began repairs on their ships in preparation for uniting with Octavian around Regium. Octavian had by now already reached Regium. Hearing that Sextus only had 40 ships in Messana, his generals urged him to attack immediately. However, not knowing of the events at Cumae, Octavian insisted on waiting for Calvisius and Menes. It proved a serious blunder, as the time he spent waiting allowed Democaris to return to Sicily successfully and reunite with Sextus. When news of the battle did reach Octavian, he decided to sail through the straits to meet the other portion of his fleet. As he did, however, his fleet was harassed by Sextus's ships that attacked along various points of the line. Octavian, either reluctant to fight in the straits or determined not to give battle without reinforcements, ordered his ships to continue without engaging, and several were cut off and destroyed. Some of his captains disobeyed the orders, turning to meet the Pompeians, one even successfully taking the flagship of Democaris, though the Pompeian managed to escape. Calvisius's fleet also arrived on the scene, but night soon fell, ending any fighting. Octavian's Sicilian invasion had got off to a poor start, many ships having been lost in the previous battle, and still more to Sextus's harassing tactics. Attempting to consolidate his forces, Octavian drew Calvisius's fleet up in a defensive formation, while he pulled his vessels close to the shore to conduct repairs. Disaster struck yet again, however, when a massive storm swept through. The Pompeian ships, which had managed to make it into Sicilian harbours, were safe, while Octavians, close to the coast, were dashed against rocks. The notoriously treacherous waters of the straits crashed his ships into one another, with the infamous whirlpools drowning many who fell into the sea. Only Menes's squadron, which had the foresight to put out to open water, managed to avoid calamity. It was a scene of utter carnage, with the cries of men thrown overboard lasting throughout the night and crushing his men's morale. By the time the storm finally broke, most of Octavian's fleet, including the sailors, had been lost. By approximately the summer of 38 BC, Octavian realized that his invasion had been a failure, leaving the fleet and making for Vibo, 
warning his friends and generals to be prepared for any potential uprisings against him, and stationing men along the coast in preparation for an invasion of Italy by Sextus. When Sextus got wind of these events and how devastating the storm had been, he interpreted it as a sign of the gods' favour and proclaimed himself the son of Neptune. Despite the significant losses Octavian had suffered, Sextus did not press his advantage, likely because he was not confident that he would have the manpower to pull off an invasion of the mainland. Octavian, however, was not a man to give up easily. He sent word to Antony requesting his support, and perhaps most importantly, recalled Agrippa, who had been governing in Gaul and quelling revolts. Octavian would prepare for yet another attempted invasion, and this time Agrippa would lead. Agrippa was made consul for 37 BC, despite being significantly under the traditional minimum age for the office, and immediately undertook the task of creating a vast fleet for Octavian. However, he soon realized that there was no harbour on the west coast of Italy to house such a large fleet. More importantly, he would need a port where the ships could be constructed secretively, free from attacks by Sextus's forces. Undeterred, Agrippa began the construction of one of the Roman Republic's greatest engineering achievements, the Portus Julius. Agrippa knew that Lake Aveno would be hidden from any ships sailing the coast, so he planned for this to be the base of his harbour, linking Lake Aveno to Lake Lucrino with a canal, and from Lucrino to the sea with a second canal. The harbour he built would prove to be large enough to hold the whole fleet and conduct training manoeuvres. Combined with a large tunnel that led to the port from Cumae, the Portus Julius could build ships, train sailors, and supply without any risk of detection from the sea. It was a marvel of logistics and engineering, the ruins of which can still be seen under the waters today. Octavian's position improved further in the spring of 37 BC, when Antony arrived in Tarentum with 300 ships to assist in the invasion and messages were sent to Lepidus in Africa to prepare his forces for the attack. Octavian was not ready yet though, as many of his ships were still under construction. Antony, who was organizing his Parthian campaign, was frustrated at this delay, but persisted, hoping that Octavian would repay the favor by assisting whenever Antony's invasion of Parthia began. Octavian, however, was still angry at Antony for not having sent men to help the previous year, it is even possible that Octavian deliberately slowed the production of his own fleet to frustrate Antony's plans. On this occasion, Antony acted as the bigger man, probably listening to the advice of his wife, Octavian's sister Octavia. He assured Octavian they were allies with no bad blood, working towards the same common goal. The two were reconciled, declaring that they and Lepidus would hold triumviral power for another five years without consulting anyone else, including Lepidus himself. Octavian nonetheless felt he had no choice but to delay the invasion again the following year. Antony, unable to postpone his Parthian invasion any longer, offered a compromise by gifting Octavian 130 ships in return for the promise of four of Octavian's legions. Octavian gladly accepted the offer. Meanwhile, Menas, for unknown reasons, defected yet again, going back to Sextus's side. Calvisius, who failed to report this to Octavian, was removed from his position, and Agrippa was made overall commander of Octavian's navy. By the spring of 36 BC, Octavian was ready. He had roughly 300 ships, including the 130 of Antony under Antony's lieutenant Taurus and 21 legions picked for the invasion. Lepidus was also ready in Africa with 70 warships, 12 legions and auxiliaries. The plan was simple. Taurus would attack Sicily from the east, Lepidus from the south and west, and Octavian and Agrippa from the north. They would effectively attack Sicily from all sides and overwhelm it. The invasion began, but yet again it was plagued by disaster Lepidus, sailing from Africa, was hit by a large storm that destroyed almost 1,000 supply ships in the crossing. The same storm also hit Octavian and Agrippa's section, forcing them to return to Italy to spend 30 days repairing their vessels. Despite these setbacks, however, 
Lepidus's contingent had successfully landed on Sicily, besieging Lilibaeum and winning over other cities in the area. In an attempt to capitalize on this foothold, Lepidus tried to transport four more legions over. However, they had not been provided with an escort to move them quickly, and elements of Sextus's fleet could attack them in the crossing, causing two legions worth of men to be lost in the fight. Nevertheless, Sextus still acted cautiously, keeping his fleet safe in port and sending a relief force to Lilibaeum. This lack of offensive action caused Menas to, once more, change sides, defecting back to Octavian, who readily accepted him but ordered him to be watched closely and only hold limited command. When Octavian sailed his portion of the fleet to the Aeolian Islands and still got no response from Sextus, it encouraged him to be even more aggressive. Leaving Agrippa in command of the fleet, he returned to Italy to take three legions to Taurus in Tarentum, intending to lead Taurus's force personally to attack from the east. At the same time, Agrippa would continue attacking Sicily from the north. Agrippa left around 50 ships in port at Hiera and sailed with perhaps 100 ships to Mile, where he had learned that Demacaris was stationed with 40 ships, hoping to win a quick and easy victory. Sextus, meanwhile, heard of this movement and sailed personally to Demacaris' position with a further 115 ships. When Agrippa realized he was now facing almost all of the Pompeian navy, he immediately sent word back to Hiera to bring up the rest of his ships as quickly as they could and drew up his fleet for battle. Sextus chose not to command the battle personally, instead observing from the shoreline and assigning command to his lieutenant, Papius. The Pompeian fleet was slightly larger and with years of naval experience, worthy better sailors, sailing in slightly smaller and faster ships, prioritizing naval skill and trained to disable enemy vessels. On the other hand, Agrippa's fleet had heavier and slower ships, built primarily for boarding enemy ships to better utilize the Caesarean advantage in more experienced infantry. On top of this, the greater size of Agrippa's ships meant that his missile troops on the ship's towers would have a slight height advantage. The battle commenced, the Pompeian ships using their greater maneuverability to destroy the Caesarean oars, aiming to isolate individual ships or small groups of the enemy to take them out of the battle. Pompeian ships that got too close were quickly grappled by the Caesareans and pulled closer. The Caesareans, from their higher decks and towers, showered the Pompeians with arrows and javelins before boarding, many Pompeians abandoning their ships and jumping overboard. During the course of the battle, Agrippa located Papius's ship and engaged it with his own, shattering the hull with the initial ram. Papius was able to escape to another ship nearby and re-engaged. Still, Sextus from the shore realized that the battle was going poorly, and seeing Agrippa's reinforcements approaching on the horizon ordered a withdrawal. The Pompeian ships were able to execute a well-ordered withdrawal to nearby shoals, where Agrippa's heavier and larger vessels would not be able to pursue them. Initially, Agrippa planned to blockade the fleet to keep them pinned, but convinced by his captains that he should not risk losing his victory to a storm, he agreed to withdraw. It had nonetheless been an overwhelming victory for the Caesareans, Agrippa losing just five ships and managing to capture or destroy 30. After numerous disastrous setbacks, Octavian's invasion of Sicily finally had its first significant success under Agrippa. Lepidus's siege of Lilibaeum was still ongoing, and the capture of some smaller towns in the area had given him a foothold in western Sicily. Hearing of Agrippa's success, Octavian was eager to capitalize on it and secure a similar base in the east, sailing with three legions and the rest of the navy, and landing around Tauromenium. Sextus, however, was a shrewd commander and not to be underestimated. Leaving a small portion of his fleet at Mile to give the impression that the harbour was still full, Sextus sailed with most of his ships under the cover of darkness towards Tauromenium. Octavian would soon find himself almost completely surrounded and fighting for his life. In our next episode, we will cover this battle and the rest of Octavian's Sicilian invasion. So make sure you have subscribed and pressed the bell button.
Recently, we've started releasing weekly patron and YouTube member exclusive videos. Join the ranks of patrons and YouTube members via the link in the description or by pressing the button under the video to watch these weekly videos, learn about our schedule, get early access to our videos, join our private Discord, and much more. Please consider liking, commenting, and sharing. It helps immensely. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.